Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. We cover everything major league from spring training to the World Series. We've got your favorite club covered from New York to Boston to L.A. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Yeah, we're here. We finally made it. October 20th, Game 1, Tampa Bay Rays, L.A. Dodgers. And we finally get to talk about it. It's happening. Now, by the time you hear this podcast here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast, on the GSMC Podcast Network, your host, Colin Manley, by the time you hear this, Game 1 will be done. We'll have a winner. We have someone taking the lead. But... That doesn't mean we don't have a lot to talk about about this entire series in general, along with a few other things in baseball. Now, I'm excited, as I imagine you are, because we've said it many times. I didn't expect us to get here. I didn't expect us to get this far. And (laughs) we have to look upon this World Series, this playoffs, And continue to be thankful with everything that has happened to get to this point. Now, there were some bumps along the way. But we need to talk about why this ended up to be one of the best results we could have possibly gotten. We're going to also talk about, don't worry, our Astros and Braves. What's next for those two teams? We got to get into that conversation. We got to talk about comparing our World Series teams. Look at this matchup. Maybe look at each position, how they break down. And I also want to discuss some players that could really turn the tide in this series, be the reason that one team wins and another team is going home. But I want to start with updating on this postseason bracket. So obviously, if you've been following along, you know the Dodgers won in seven, Tampa Bay won in seven, to go on to the World Series. And I want to (laughs) reflect upon this and really talk about once again how this couldn't have been a better outcome for the MLB so obviously the 16 teams that make it the best of three series we've talked about that went well in the sense of the teams that are really good moved on the competitive series they were still there we had some upsets it was a fun first round it kind of gave us a little bit of everything what we wanted to see the division series led into a lot of great actual division matchups that was awesome. We, we got to see these rivals, these foes that were battling each other all season, go up against each other to move on. And, you know, in the National League, it was quick work. The American League, a little more competitive. Then we get to our championship series, and both series go best of seven. Seven games. And they gave us <laughs> the exact same thing on both sides. The Rays stormed out to a commanding lead. The Astros came back, down 3-0. They are the first team in MLB history to come back from 3-0 and lose Game 7. Boston still holding on to that title. But they came back to make it seven games. Exciting. So, so close, but not quite there. And then on the other side, the Braves were up. Dodgers come back, and they actually take the series. So we see it go both ways. And now that it's World Series time, this is where it couldn't be possibly any better than we could have imagined. Now, you can tell me, hey, one team is more talented than the other. You might like a team better than the other. But here's what it comes down to. We have the best regular season record in the American League and the National League make the World Series championship here. That is not a guarantee in baseball. Sorry, it doesn't happen all that time. Baseball postseason is actually known to be a little crazy and wild, and it's usually the team that's hot that continues on. In the NFL, those high seeds usually carry on. In the NBA, those high seeds usually move on. Hockey can get a little crazy from time to time, but baseball is definitely known to have teams surprise us and make it to the World Series. 
we see it more often than not. So it is great to actually see these teams have to fight, go through some perseverance, and make it and prove that they really are the teams to represent to get the pennant in their respective leagues. And the other thing that I tend to really like about this, and I think a lot of people would agree, is just how crazy different these two teams are. <laughs> these are just two very different franchises. They could not be more apart from each other. So now the Dodgers have six titles in 20 tries, I mean the 20th try this year. The Rays have zero titles in two tries, I mean their second World Series ever. Okay, we have a storied, history franchise versus one that's, you know, trying to get their first title. There's a massive difference in payroll between these two teams. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen the graphic that Mookie Betts and Clayton Kershaw make more than the Tampa Bay Rays entire team. Mookie Betts and Clayton Kershaw make more than the Tampa Bay Rays combined. Okay, the Dodgers, obviously, big market, very big market. They get to buy a lot of guys. They can trade for a lot of guys. They can take on a lot of money. Tampa Bay, they don't even sell out their stadium sometimes. I mean, they're, they're struggling to get people in the stands. There's, there will be questions down the road about Tampa Bay, the Rays actually staying in Tampa Bay. It happens, okay? There's a lot of questions there. And the Dodger following is just hardcore. When you get over to California, Dodgers fans, that, that's that's a thing. Very different. And, you know, we can talk about how these teams are constructed. And the thing that I love seeing here is, I, I, this is obviously true in a lot of different sports, is that there's many different ways to construct your team. Many different ways that you can build a contender and a championship quality level team. The Dodgers have that money luxury. Okay, they can make trades. They can take on money. They can pay bad contracts to get a good player. Okay, we've seen that happen in the past. They're not scared to do that. The Rays make budget deals. They make a lot of trades. I, I'm, I'm at the point where we have to understand, don't trade with Tampa Bay. <laughs> they, they're going to win the deal. What... What is it with the Tampa Bay that they just understand who is great value? They send off guys when they're about to get paid, and they get back players, and they just continue to be competitive as of late. Now, that obviously hasn't been going on forever, but as of recent, when it comes to ownership with the Rays, they know what they're doing. Oh, and not to mention, they kind of have the best farm in baseball right now. <sighs> How does this happen? You know, it's two very different teams, two highly competitive teams, two of the best in baseball, respectively, in their own leagues. And we got to see it all unfold this way. I mean, and the the whole idea of what they had to do to get here, too, was so much fun. L.A., quick work of the Brewers. Move on to your division rival in the Padres. And the Padres got just smoked by the Dodgers. You overcome the Braves when they really had you down to show that, yeah, our offense, our team, we're for real. Tampa Bay makes quick work of the Blue Jays. One division foe goes on to the Yankees, which when they were healthy are a scary team. But Tampa Bay showed, no, we didn't, we didn't just win the division by chance here, guys. Yeah, the Yankees had a lot of injuries, but we got this. Best of five. And then a Houston Astros team that's trying to prove everything and show everything. Gives them everything they have. Doesn't matter. Not enough. I, I, I just, I sit here in awe. I really am surprised with everything that we have seen happen so far. All of the positive tests, delays in games, having to go to double headers, issues with injury so far this season, 
I mean, think about everything that happened with pitchers this year. This is one of the worst years we've seen for pitching injuries in quite some time. We lost a lot of great players that are known by name, but also there's a lot of guys you probably don't even know that are having some serious arm issues. And that's one thing that's going to be scary. It's going to be something coming out of this year we're going to have to be concerned about, but that's a different conversation for another day. Because of such a quick startup. And even with all of that to happen, everything, we sit here, game one of the World Series, with the number one team in the American League and the number one team in the National League set to square off. I I just, I don't, I don't imagine a much better outcome. I really don't. Maybe some people would be arguing that, hey, if we got the Yankees to be healthy the whole year, maybe some Astros players not having to battle through some injuries that, you know, losing Verlander hurt. You got to overcome injuries. I mean, you can look at these Tampa Bay and this Dodgers team as well. They overcame a lot of injuries this season as well. Tampa Bay had injuries all over the place. They put their roster together. L.A., they worked with pitchers kind of shuffling in and out all the time. And it didn't seem to matter. They overcame. They continued to win. They busted themselves in series that they needed to come back. Story, storybook, right? Storybooks type of stuff. Now all we need is for this series to go seven games, throw in maybe some extra innings. <laughs> that, that's what we need. Some real extra inning games. It doesn't, it doesn't get much better. So really definitely proud to see how this season went out. And Rob Manfred, rest of MLB, bravo. Got to be happy with what you have. Now you take the things you learned from this season, you implement it, you fix some things, some issues that you had next year. You're starting to put together a great product. Adapt your product. A lot of great stuff. A lot of great stuff. But we need to move on. It's fun to reflect on the playoffs, but we got to start talking about in the moment now. And we're going to have to take a look at some teams and decisions that they have to make in their upcoming offseason. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Houston Astros. I'm looking at you, Atlanta Braves. We got to talk about what's going to be the next steps for these two teams. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and come back. And let's say, let's see what we need to do with these two moving forward here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. It's just the truth of the game. Seasons have to end at some time. You know, I, I sit there and I think about it as a fan a lot. I, I get upset. I, I have to be honest. I get upset when my team doesn't push on or advance and around, make the playoffs, go on to a championship series, whatever. Whatever it is. I get upset quite often just because you aren't the team that wins it all. You're not the one standing on top at the end of the day. But we have to be honest about this stuff. We need to talk about this. It's very hard to win a championship. Very, very hard. The Dodgers have been there quite a few times to the World Series, and they have not been capitalizing at the highest level. But it's still quite impressive that they get there. The Houston Astros are a team that have been around that World Series quite a bit. But now that their season is over, we need to talk about what's the next move. And they have... Some next moves that need to be happening. It's going to be interesting to look at them because they could be a very different team next year. The Astros, second team ever to force a Game 7 after falling behind 3-0 in the playoffs. Unfortunately, they're that team to lose. 
So no Boston Red Sox type story here. So they have to move on to the offseason and make some decisions. Now, they have some names that are notable free agents. George Springer, Michael Brantley, Brad Peacock, Chris Devensky, and Josh Reddick. All free agents going into the offseason. Trade candidates, Yuli Guriel, Alex Bregman, Carlos Correa, potentially. Some guys that are extension candidates. You could also think about extending Carlos Correa, Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker, Alvarez and Tucker being some young, promising players for them, Josh James being a few of them. I, I definitely have a lot of questions about this team. And my first kind of question, the timing couldn't be any better because we just had the ex-Astros GM kind of going out saying that he was, he didn't know what was going on still. He's still trying to kind of defend himself, that he wasn't involved in the whole cheating scandal, kind of bringing up, talking about the evidence and everything. And we had, you know, Manfred go on ESPN and talk about, well, the not necessarily true. There's a lot of evidence there to why his punishment came down as well. And I sit here and I wonder, with some of these free agents, if they are at the point where they kind of just want to wash them, ha- wash their hands of the Astros. Move on and show that they are great players away from that organization. And that cheating scandal doesn't necessarily define them. If the Astros are able to hold on to a lot of the players they have, they can be competitive again next year. They can be competitive. But these guys have some of the biggest decisions to make on whether or not they want to stick around and maybe take any ridicule. Because here's here's the thing we have to remember. 2020 was a weird season because we did not have fans in the stadiums. And when it comes down to it, when these fans are allowed back in fully, that will be the first time that the Houston Astros kind of truly get their punishment from the masses. Now, they could be on social media. They could be looking at all of the reports on stuff that's on SportsCenter, the discussions, everything. But it's not quite the same until you actually have those fans breathing down on you. And they kind of avoided that this season. So I wonder if there's going to be some free agents that are going to try to get away from that situation and get away from that. Now, we don't know when fans are going to be back full time. Could be next year, maybe halfway through next year. Maybe it's two seasons from now. We don't know. But there's a lot that could happen there. And so the first question that kind of leads into this with the free agents is, are they going to re-sign George Springer? And this Astros outfield it could look very different next year. He's been with the organization the longest. Back in the rebuild. He's been there for a long time. Along with Reddick and Brantley all hitting the market, it just feels like Springer's kind of the guy who's been there a little longer. He's a more part of this franchise. And Springer could end up being more of an upper tier free agent. He could go get some money. And Even with teams maybe being a little scared to go into free agency and spend too much money, that doesn't mean that Brantley won't find himself a place. He still can hit. He can still play outfield. He can still DH. How the Astros are going to move forward with spending their own money is going to be interesting because they have a lot in big money. Verlander, Granke, Bregman, Altuve. And... Carlos Correa is coming towards the end of his arbitration window, which means he could get a big contract as well. And that's a lot of names that are making big money, but aren't necessarily contributing all that much. Now, Verlander's not going to be there next year. Granke, been good for him, but sorry, he's going to be an older starter for you. Bregman and Altuve had down years. Is that real, or is that going to be something that comes back? If you also wonder, like, why wouldn't the Astros maybe have worked out an extension already? That's possibly something. They might let Springer to go test the market and see what he can have. He's one of the names I'm looking at. 
And in all honesty, all of these free agents, it's just, it's very interesting to watch if many of them will come back. We'll, we'll see what Houston does going there. Another thing we have to look at is what's going to be the starting rotation next year. Now we talked about it. Verlander's not going to be there next year. Granke is getting older. Okay. Granke's going to be 37 years old. And while he'll still be able to produce for you a little bit, he's not the shut the door ace that he has been in the past. Lance McCullers is there. Framber Valdez, Anoli, Paredes, Irquiti, Boris Whitley, Christian Javier, Luis Garcia. That's just the start of young names, young pitchers that will be able to contribute to the Astros in the coming years and help that team a great deal. It looks like starting pitching could be a strength in the future, in the very near future. And with that said, it leaves the Astros in an interesting situation on how they want to spend their money and construct the rest of their roster. Because things could be great for them. And for a team that just lost you know, Justin Verlander, who was great for them, but get to bring back the pitching they will have after this season, things are going to work out for them in that department. How are they going to construct the rest of their team? And it leads into the, was any of the decline for a lot of these players real? Was what we saw with El Tuve real? What we saw with Reddick, Brantley, yes, these guys are leaving, Bregman, was it a real decline for some of these guys? Or are they going to bounce back in a bigger game sample? Now, we could argue a little bit that Altuve would be a yes in that situation. He started to show up in the postseason a little bit. Some of these other guys started to show up in the postseason and hit a little bit. But these guys have a 60-game sample against them, which is very concerning. And Altuve at this point has four years and $116 million left on his contract. And if that decline is real... We're going to have to start talking about his money and what we're going to do with that. He's another one of those names that's going to be interesting to watch, see what happens up in the air. They're at a small turning point in their franchise history. They've been really good, really competitive. But they have some big decisions that they need to make if they want to continue to be competitive and continue to push late into the postseason. Their pitching is going to be there. It's going to be the rest that they have to talk about. So, fun. I, the Astros, what they have done really is incredible. I mean, they were such a bad team for a long time. Collected all these picks, got all these prospects, and turned it around. They don't want to go back to that. So let's see what happens with them moving forward. The other team that we lost, well, we got to talk about these Atlanta Braves. Now, if I'm a fan of the Atlanta Braves, I'm sitting here with some optimism. Yes, it's a flat-out bummer, Atlanta fans, period. What happens to you guys in sports? I'm sorry. But they're close. They're there. The first thing that I had written down that I thought about is run it back with an upgrade or two. Run it back. This team is not that bad. Base running mistake. Man, that's that's going to be the thing that's that just sticks with me. And the NLCS, that was costly. <sighs> Big time double play that happened in Game 7. Costly. Just some small mistakes that they hurt themselves. This team is good. They have some talent. Change a few things and they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. But they do have questions to answer just as much as any other franchise. So, notable free agents, Marcelo Zunia. We're going to come back to that. That's a big one. Nick Markakis, Tyler Flowers, Cole Hamels, Mark Melikon, Shane Green, Josh Tomlin. Trade candidates, Ender Inkintar. Extension candidates, Dansby Swanson, Max Freed, Mike Soroka. The first thing that we need to talk about when it comes to the Braves next season is something that there was a battle all year. There's a battle in the postseason, but they weathered that storm pretty well. Is what is this starting rotation going to look like? Ian Anderson was a pleasant, pleasant, pleasant surprise. 
That was awesome to them. They know they have a young starter there. Freed, we know, is a stud. Great pitcher for them. You obviously want to have hopes that some other guys come back healthy. Mike Soroka is optimistic he'll be ready for opening day after tearing his Achilles, but tough injury. Tough injury to come back from. But if you get him back at some time in the season, Freed, Soroka, Anderson's a great start. In 2019, they made a move to get Dallas Keiko for a one-year deal. and Cole Hamill's one-year deal in 2020. You have some young guys that's, you know, struggled during the past season. So I wonder if they could be an interesting team to look at some free agents on one-year deals. And with that said, if there is one free agent on a one-year deal that comes to mind, <clears throat> enter Trevor Bauer. Bauer plans on signing one-year deals to optimize his money. Maximize it. That might fall into the plan of what the Braves are looking to do next year. Give him a major payday, bring him in, hope Soroka's healthy, and then you get to roll out there Trevor Bauer, Max Fried, Ian Anderson, and Mike Soroka as your top four starters. <laughs> that looks pretty great. And, you know, there's other options. There's other options. Mike Miner, Rick Porcello, Robbie Bray, Cole Hamels. You, you can do a cheap, cheaper one-year option as well. But I imagine they're going to go get another starter. There's going to be a starter in the talks because you can't just hope Soroka is going to be good no matter how much he looks in the offseason, how great he looks in the offseason. you you got to plan for another guy to be there, and it's only going to help you in the long run. Resigning Marcelo Zuna. Azunia. The Braves have done well. Donaldson in 2019, Azunia in 2020. They bring in guys that one-year deals. They pay off. Their big offensive production. Azunia had two so so years with the Cardinals. Comes in, hits the ball well for the Braves. Did he hit well enough to get himself a longer contract somewhere else? Or does he stay another short term deal with the Braves to contend? What is going to be his priority in all of this? He also could be an option for the DH. If the DH sticks around, there's a lot of questions there. So I think that's, again, that's that run it back mentality. I think you want to bring back Azunia for one more year and try to keep this offense that you have. The other question that might be an upgrade situation, and I don't want to give up on a guy just because he's young, but is Austin Riley the guy at third base moving forward. Again, very young. Entering, he's going to be 24. 24 years old. Just over 500 career at bats. So there's still a lot of potential there. But third base needs to be a place of production sometimes in a lot of these teams. And I think the Braves, while they should go, they're going to go with him, I believe, right away to start. Don't be scared to consider a move there to help that position. They, There's going to be an upgrade or two. I'm hoping one is in the starting rotation. Maybe we don't see like a Nick Markakis come back and they try to make another move in the outfield. But they also are going to have to look at their bullpen a little bit as well, try to make sure that that stays steady. There is a lot going on here. And I think the Braves, like I said, need to run it back and try to just upgrade a few spots because they're right there. They're right there in competing for a title. So that's what we have looking at our two teams that just got booted out. Uh, Optimistic. Optimistic about both of them. They have bright things to look forward to. It is a big-time offseason for these two. Let's see if they end up making some of the right decisions. So we need to move on, and we got to talk about that actual World Series that's going on. we got to compare our World Series teams. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, talk about where do these teams stack up against each other? Where are they better than the other? And what's going to be some things that really benefit these teams? Coming up here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Comes to the postseason, two teams, the best of the best, the cream of the crop. We have to start looking at some position to position breakdown and really talk about maybe why one team has an advantage over the other. So we're going to start off with comparing these two teams, working our way up. I, I think some of these are pretty easy. I think I don't think there's going to be a lot of argument when it comes down to it. Both of these teams are pretty loaded in a lot of different spots. Now, I just want to flat out say right away, defensively, both of these teams are pretty darn good. Pretty darn good, considering to be about top five defenses in the MLB. So I I don't think there's necessarily an advantage of one over the other in that sense. So I'm going to look at a lot of offensive production. We'll talk a little bit about defense, but also we're going to talk about some pitching performances as well. And starting things off with, you know, catching, Mike Zanino and Michael Perez, they had good hitting seasons and, or didn't have good hitting seasons really. And overall, catching is not a very strong position. It's hard to have great catching in the MLB these days. There's really not that many that's great. We need to talk about the fact that Zanino, though, has been all right in the postseason in hitting some home runs. He has four home runs. Had a big one in Game 7 of the ALCS. But overall, that position hasn't been too strong for Tampa. The Dodgers have had Will Smith, who has been pretty solid. The Dodgers also have been kind of one of the better hitting, catching groups throughout the year. Now, a lot of the postseason hits for Will Smith came in one game. But the talent seems to be there a little bit better, leaning towards the Dodgers, having some more offensive production for them from the catcher position. So that's that's one point that would go the Dodgers. Now, first base, this is going to be kind of a committee for the Rays as well. So G-Man Choi, going to be our lefty guy. Yandy Diaz, who's going to get the start in game one tonight against Kershaw, being the righty guy. Could be alternating there. Could be some guys getting some DH love as well. Choi has hit all right in the postseason. Diaz is not, but he was pretty solid in the regular season, and he's still getting walked. So he's been all right there. Meanwhile, a little more consistent play. The Dodgers are playing Max Muncy, who isn't as great as the last couple years, but he was hitting a lot better in the NLCS. Nine walks, four extra base hits, two home runs. This is a betting on talent type thing again. As much as G-Men Choi and Yanni Diaz are great, Muncy might just be a little bit better at his best. Unless if Yandy Diaz kind of gets things rolling again, I think we're going to be leaning Dodgers there a little bit as well again. So two points, kind of Dodgers. Second base, I'm kind of betting on a guy who was great all year. I mean, I kind of used talent for the first two, so I'm going to use it a little bit for this one as well. Brandon Lau had an unbelievable season for Tampa, was going to be getting some MVP considerations. His postseason has been just not good enough. Michael Brousseau has also been in there. Gives a nice little platoon option with him and Lau. But we're probably going to see a lot of Lau in this. If he kind of flips things and starts looking like he did in the regular season, the the Rays kind of wrap this up. They're they're the better spot there. 
The Dodgers have Chris Taylor, little Kiki Hernandez. Every now and then, Muncy will be in there, but it, I would lean Rays at this position. So second base, I would go there. So two to one, Dodgers leading. Now shortstop, this is where it's kind of a butter, bummer. William Dames is amazing defensively. Makes every play out there, it feels like. Now, he hasn't been hitting that great in October, in the postseason, and he did in the regular season. So the talent is there. And you would almost kind of lean him for, you know, winning this advantage. But the problem is Corey Seager came alive in the NLCS. 947 OPS in the first two rounds, hit 307 in the regular season. He had five home runs in the NLCS. I mean, he is playing unbelievable, Corey Seager, right now. So that's why I have to give the nod there to the Dodgers. So 3-1 Dodgers so far. Third base, again, it's going to be a lot of kind of a platoon for the Rays. Joey Wendell, Brasso, Andy Diaz, there's options there. And that's a strong hitting option. Okay. Each of these three have had good defensive moments, some moments hitting. Brasso, that big home run off for all the Chapman, you can't forget that. They're going to get mixed up in a variety of ways. Very different, again, from Los Angeles having a little more steady where Justin Turner is going to be playing there. He's continuing to hit. Continuing to hit pretty solid. 881 career postseason mark OPS. He's 860 this year. Has an 886 in the seven years for the Dodgers. He's been all right. He's not as good as he used to be defensively. But he has been good enough. And I'm going to go a little bit with the upside there for Turner as well. So I'm going to go Dodgers again. So we have 4-1. I think I lean Dodgers right now in this. Okay. Left field. Uh, this one's pretty easy. Now there's a little mixing and matching. There's going to be some platoon stuff here as well. But Aro Zarenia is kind of the guy for left field there. And if you haven't been paying attention, this guy is kind of everything right now for Tampa Bay. He has been phenomenal. He was a Cardinal last year. The Cardinals traded him to Tampa Bay for pretty much nothing. Again, you don't win trades with Tampa. You're going to see some other guys slide in there. Austin Meadows might be out there, but mostly Arozarena is kind of the guy. Now, the Dodgers don't have a bad left fielder. A.J. Pollock is just fine, but Randy's just been hitting way too well. So that one's going to the race. So 5-2, what we have so far. Center field, Kevin Kiermeyer is great. One of the best defensive outfielders there is. That's going to matter. He plays very well defensively. Problem is, the center fielder that we have for the Dodgers is really darn good as well. Bellinger, Cody Bellinger, is very good defensively. He's not... As good as Kiermaier, but Kiermaier's a pretty, you know, lofty expectations. He's up there. Thing is, Bellinger has the bat. He is a stud. Now, there's going to be concerns with potentially his shoulder popping out. Game 7 for Bellinger, if that's going to hurt him in the long run. Now, health will play into this. Health will play into this. But when it comes down to it, Bellinger's defense is up there with Kiermaier. Not as good, but it's up there. His offense is just way better than Kiermaier. He just doesn't hit much. He may not have to hit. We've seen this a lot. We see outfielders that are so good defensively, whatever they give you at the plate is a bonus. And that might be what we're looking for there. But that advantage has to go Dodgers. So that's 6-2. A lot of this positional stuff. Right field, Manuel Margot. Similar to Kiermaier. Good defender. Bats not as great. Now he had three home runs in the ALCS. Meadows is going to play there a little bit as well. Much more better hit, much more of a hitter, Meadows is. But Margot is the guy defensively that's going to be there. Problem is, <laughs> this is just like what Tampa Bay had with Ara Zarina. Mookie Betts is in right field. And he might just be the best player in this entire World Series right now. Sorry. Six straight division titles. Reached the World Series twice in the previous three years. And then these guys add Mookie Betts. 
It's paid off because he's looked good defensively. He's been giving them some stuff offensively. It's just an easy, easy nod there. Designated hitter. This is where things are a little bit interesting. We're going to see a lot of different guys, so I can't necessarily say that I love one person in one situation than another. Ar Arena is going to be getting a lot of looks there. He's going to get some DH opportunities, especially against Clayton Kershaw tonight. Meadows will be used against righties. There's other guys who get thrown in there. Yanni Diaz will maybe get in there. It's going to be a platoon type thing. Same with the Dodgers. Jock Peterson, Edwin Rios, Austin Barnes. There's going to be a lot of guys used. So I don't know if I necessarily favor one over the other because it's just going to be a lot of matchup base. So I'm going to kind of put that one as a wash. So just going through a lot of the offensive positions, it leans Dodgers a lot more than the Rays. So that needs to be said. When I look at these two teams, I'm thinking Dodgers over Rays when it comes to a lot of the positions. But when we start looking at pitching is where things change. Blake Snell, Tyler Glass now, Charlie Morton. That's a great starting three. And then Ryan Yarbrough, not bad as a fourth. Now, the thing that's going to be a little different in the World Series compared to a lot of other previous matchups in the postseason is we're going to have a couple days off in there. That's going to come as a great, great thing for these teams and their starting rotations. And it almost feels like it benefits the Rays a little bit more just because their top three guys are so good. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like the Dodgers are awful. Okay, Walker Bueller is a pretty darn good pitcher. Clayton Kershaw has been okay this postseason. But we also know about his postseason history. Now, I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. He's looked good so far. Let's, let's hope it doesn't go that direction. Dustin May will be used out there. Who, who's going to be the other guy's start? That's the thing. It's going to get interesting who's going to start what. At the beginning of the game, they asked Dave Roberts, like, hey, you, you don't know who game two starter is going to be yet. And it's, it's going to be interesting. This could go a lot of different ways. But when it comes to just which one do you feel more comfortable with, which one do you think is solid, I would say starting pitching definitely leans towards Tampa. Okay. Now, bullpen. Bullpen here. The Rays had a steady, steady bullpen ERA. 3.37 in the regular season. Dodgers were second best. But that's really difficult to look at that and say, okay, one's better than the other. The depth in... The Rays' bullpen is scary. They have a long list of guys who could come in at any moment and really do great things, carry a game. I consider them to be more reliable at this stage in the playoffs than the Dodgers. And it's just because they have an endless group of guys. I mean, they, they throw righty, lefty. They all throw hard. They come from different arm angles. Kevin Cash has a lot, of, a lot to work with. And I have concerns when it comes to the Dodgers bullpen. And I don't want to talk about this too much because I want to talk about this a little bit in the next segment as well. But we don't know necessarily who's the confident guy they're going to at the back end right now. So I'm going to have to go raise here. In the bullpen as well. So right now, offensive leans Dodgers, pitching leans Rays. And which one ends up mattering more would have to go into your prediction. Which one do you think is going to win? This this is a nice, nice, nicely matched World Series in the sense of what we have for offensive talent versus pitching talent. Just another reason why we, we have to say, man, this, this worked out really well. My gut wants me to love the Rays more. I want to believe in this team more. I just I have this feeling with them, with their pitching, with how they just find ways to win, even if their offensive production isn't as good as the Dodgers. Their defense is so solid. 
And when you have defense and a bullpen in the postseason, a lot of things can happen and go your way. But my head tells me that offensive talent for the Dodgers is just too good. They can overcome a lot of great starting pitching and bullpen pitching because they have the depth and a lot of different guys that can mash. I, I, I don't have a confident prediction. I really don't. I, I, I truly feel the series is going to go seven games. And when you have to go seven, the pitching advantage, I feel like, comes more into play. So I'm kind of leaning right now, raising seven. That's where I'm kind of leaning. But I can't say that I'm 100% confident in putting my stamp either way. I really am not. I just think this series extends. And when you're going to extend a steer series, just give me the team with the better pitching. That's kind of where my head is at right now. So we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. It really could go either way. Again, I'm just hoping and praying for a great series. So that's what we have when we compare these two teams. We have one more segment left. I want to talk about players that are going to help turn the tide for one team to take it all here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. So this happens in every series, every sport. We can look at things, look at matchups, and we can talk about guys that we think are going to be the ones to end up turning the tide or being the big reason why a team in particular can win a series, a championship, a round, a controversial game, whatever. Okay, There's going to be these guys that we talk about. So I wanted to dive into this myself. I wanted to take an opportunity to look at each team and try to pick something on both sides on who I think is going to matter the most in this series. Now, I wanted to take an offensive player from both sides. I wanted to take a pitcher from both sides. And I wanted to talk about one other thing that I think is kind of a wild card. So now, I want to start off with the Dodgers because this one has a soft spot for me. And so I want to bring it up. I want to get it done with. I want to talk about it and just move on. Okay? The Dodgers have been really good for the last how many years? Okay? It's... it's They've been winning the National League West consistently for a while. They've been making it deep in the postseason most years. They've been going to, you know, championship series. They've gone to the World Series. But they just haven't had enough as of recent to finish things off. So they went out and they got Mookie Betts, an MVP player, a guy who has won with the Boston Red Sox. Offensively, defensively, arm talent, speed, he has it all. He's a five-tool talent. This is the guy that has been brought in. And I've talked about this before, but I'm going to say it again. He might unfairly be getting a lot of criticism if they don't win. Why? Because he is the guy that's brought in to put them over the top. Mookie Betts is one of the best players in the MLB. And... He can play his best baseball, but he needs to bring his best baseball. He has to. I don't think he has a choice in this series. Any slump from him is going to be magnified. You're the last two on the biggest stage. So he needs to be there to turn the tide. His production has to be solid. Make some plays defensively. It always seems like he finds a way to do it. I, I, I just, I'll never forget this guy in Boston, okay? He, every time he has an opportunity to do something, it feels like he doesn't. 
Routine plays to the outfield become great opportunities for him. He'll throw people out. He'll make diving plays. He'll rob home runs. It really looks like in this this field in Texas, these outfielders can make some great plays. I mean, that, that, that's been happening. I'm curious to see that keep going. And the eyes are going to be on Mookie to be a big reason why this offense continues to click. And again, it's, it's going to be unfair criticism. And he's been good enough so far. 311 batting average, 5 RBIs, 20 total bases. Now, he hasn't been the best guy offensively for them, but he's been good. He's been good. He's doing enough. He needs to continue to produce and be that stud, a strong performer for the Dodgers. Okay? Batten on the top of that lineup, try to get things going right away. So he's the guy that I'm looking at at the top right there. When it comes to the Rays, this will come as no surprise as well. No surprise. You know who needs to keep batting well? Randy. Randy needs to keep batting well. <laughs> I love that. Rake all night, day, year. Arzarena has been phenomenal. 382 average, 7 home runs, 21 hits. 10 RBIs, 47 total bases. It's hard to ask him to do much more. It really is. But we need to see him keep producing. We need to see him keep going. And he is just close to doing some absolutely unbelievable things. He's close to rookie hits record, taking that from Derek Jeter. He's close to the home run record of eight in a postseason, tied with three guys on that one. There's so much that he is close to doing. And he just needs to keep producing. Now, I, I have some concerns about the Rays' offense all around in this. But he's still close enough to do so much. So much. And it it's really is incredible. He might even go on to be close to the single postseason record for hits altogether at 26. Okay, 26 hits is the record in a postseason. <laughs> the guy right now is just killing it at 21. He should get there. He should get there if he continues to play at the level he's at. I, I don't want to put too much on him because he's a rookie, so I kind of have one other guy to talk about. Brandon Lau needs to get back to being the MVP contender that he was in the American League. His performance in the postseason is scary. 115 batting average. Only six hits and 52 at bats. He's got one home run, two RBIs, 18 strikeouts. The on base percentage is 193. If he can turn things around, and even if he's batting as a 250 average guy, that's going to matter. Start producing with the other players that have already been giving you something. Usually, like, we, we talk about Mookie Betts in the sense of how he needs to be great because he's their best player. Well, Brandon Lowe was their best player for the entire season. And even though they had someone else step up in the postseason, you disappearing is not a good thing to see. So I would be looking to see that Lowe picks up his game, in a sense, to move things along. Moving on to pitching. I, I don't like doing this either. I, I don't like bringing up Clayton Kershaw's failures of the past because when it comes down to it, it's more just a conversation piece. It doesn't have that much to do with right now because right now Kershaw has been pretty solid in the postseason. He's been fine. He has long been a staple for the Dodgers and just performed I just worry that if he doesn't have enough, will the Dodgers starting pitching be fine? You can do bullpen games. We might see that game too for the Dodgers. We might see that happen. But you don't want to rely on that heavily 
three times in a series if you don't have to. And if you have a guy like Kershaw who's getting the start in game one, you usually start a guy game one in two, two situations. You have to because your last series went too long and you just have to go with the next guy. Or two, he's a guy that you hope could be going game one, game four, game seven. You can get three starts out of him in the worst case situation in a way a series is going. Or maybe best case situation. Maybe you're overperforming. But when you start someone game one, there's potentially you could see him three times. And I think Kershaw is going to have to eat some serious innings for the Dodgers if the hopes are to win a World Series. I, I just, you got to feel for that. And when I look at the Rays, at the guy that I, I'm thinking as well, it's the same same idea, same perspective. Tyler Glass now, you're starting game one. They're expecting you to go three games if possible. Now, here's the reality. Snell and Morton have been better in the playoffs altogether combined. But Glass now has the best stuff, the most strikeouts, the most electric pitches. If you can get your best from him, he's going to be able to give you the most innings and give you more relief for your bullpen. So that's why I have him down for Tampa Bay. He's the pitcher that needs to, needs to be steady. Because Morton's been good, Snell's been good, Glass, now it's your turn to step up. Be our guy. And I can't really complain about these starters. I mean, combined, combined, these guys are 7-3 and three in the postseason. These guys are a big reason why they win. But I think it's Glass now's series. He needs to step in. He needs to be the guy. To carry them into five innings, six innings, and then hand it off to your bullpen. If they get to him early, I'm a little more nervous. A little more nervous about Tampa Bay. You want your three starters to be steady. So that's what I have for those two. And then the last thing I want to talk about is I need to touch upon these bullpens. Now, I'm going to start with Tampa Bay because they're easy. If you go into the game, the seventh inning with a lead, they're going to feel confident. That's the strength of Tampa Bay right now. Our bullpen is good. Have we had some moments of shakiness a little bit? Yeah, a little bit in that Astros series. But overall, that's been their strength all season. Get to us, we'll hold it down. Easy enough. That stable of horses is strong and steady. 98 miles per hour coming from a lot of different guys. If we can get to you with a lead, we feel confident. But the other side, the Dodgers is where I have some concerns. Now, Jansen, Gratterall, struggles. Struggles in this postseason. Uh, more recently than overall, but recently. These guys need to get back to being overpowering dominant pitchers and have that confidence. Because you can't rely on Kershaw, Walker Bueller, Dustin May, all these guys to go seven innings strong. Now, another name that I'm going to watch who's got postseason experience is if Joe Kelly can be solid. But we, we got to have somebody step up in this bullpen, whether it be Jansen would be the probably the hopeful guy, to reclaim that closer spot where – I have a lead in the ninth, late in the eighth, and I can shut the door. I want to see somebody for the Dodgers be confident and step up when it's tight late in the game. And it, it, it could be any of those guys. It really could be. I mean, we have Julio Urias who has been steady out of the bullpen as well. He's only started one game, but he's pitched 16 innings. And he's been shut down. So, I mean, it could be just about anybody coming out of this bullpen. I just, you want to see it from somebody. Somebody steps up late in the game. Yes, I'm closing the door. There's nothing that's going to happen here. I have some concerns with the Dodgers. That's where it is. So each team, they have their concerns. We have some worries. We're putting it out there. If that team wants to win... 
One of these has to turn the tide or have to keep things rolling along. So that's going to be it for me here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast. I'm excited for this World Series. Glad to get this done because I want to go downstairs. I want to start watching. I want to start taking notes and get ready to talk about it in my next podcast. Mine's get released on Wednesday and Sunday. want to thank you again for downloading here on the GSMC Baseball Podcast. It means a great deal, the support. Love to have it. If you would be so kind, it would be great to leave a positive comment. Maybe something you want to talk about. Maybe you have some players that you think that will turn the tides. Maybe you want to talk about the Astros and Braves, what their offseason is going to look like. What's on your mind? A lot of different things. But I want to thank you again for listening and downloading. It means a great deal. Signing off here, I'm Colin the Manly, the GSMC Baseball Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also find Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.